In this video, we're going to review how to calculate the change in entropy when you're heating or cooling a substance. All right, in the prior video, we have seen the first application of uh, entropy or change in entropy uh, for a gas expansion. So it's now time to try to look for something that is a little bit more complex. All right, so our thermodynamic definition of entropy is what we have right here. And uh, our problem now is that we are trying to see uh, how this becomes in, or how that transforms into a workable expression when the temperature is changing. Okay, so, so this process here will be pretty simple. For example, imagine that you have a glass of water and you're trying to elevate that uh, temperature of that liquid water from maybe 25 Celsius to 50 Celsius or, or something like that, maybe a gas or maybe a protein solution, whatever it is. Right, uh, right away you see that we have a problem here and that problem is that the temperature is changing, right? So what that means is that uh, we're gonna have to integrate this, right? Because if the temperature is, is uh, changing, it's not a constant, you cannot factor it out. Okay, but you will see that this will not be difficult uh, to do. All right, so uh, let's bring that expression here and, and work with it. Change in entropy is just going to be equal to uh, the differential of the reversible heat divided over temperature. Now we're heating and cooling, uh, and we actually know how to calculate heat uh, for a heating cooling process. Right? We simply go to the definition of heat, which was simply um, it was this uh, uh, linear dependence between the heat capacity between, or or the heat is related to the temperature, and that uh, linear dependence is the heat capacity. Okay, so if we do this reversible, then the only thing that, that happens here is that you have here a differential of Q reversible. And we actually have to then specify what does it mean for a process to be reversible when you're heating or cooling that process. Well, reversibility uh, here means that uh, when you're adding energy to this glass of water or to the gas, uh, the temperature is changing smoothly throughout the system, right? So there's no hot spots anywhere. There's thermal equilibrium throughout, and that's just the only uh, really criterion for, for having a reversibility when you're changing the temperature. Okay, so well, that's going to be your assumption, that when we elevate the temperature of an object or we cool it down, uh, we make sure that uh, there's no hot spots anywhere, that there's thermal equilibrium throughout the, the system as you're elevating the temperature. Okay, so if that's the case, then uh, this looks pretty simple because the only thing that we have to do then is just bring that heat capacity differential of T up here, and uh, that's what we have to integrate. Okay, that is uh, now something that is a little simpler to, to handle. All right, so uh, you're gonna have now uh, two scenarios. One of them, uh, the simplest one, is what happens if the heat capacity does not depend on temperature. Okay, so suppose that you go to tables and you find that that heat capacity for that substance, for that water or that gas, is simply a number, right? In joules per uh, Kelvin, joules per more Kelvin, whatever it is, then if it's a number, it's a constant, and that means that you can factor it at the integral. Okay, so if the heat capacity is constant, and that is the condition for this um, derivation that we're doing here, then you can simply do this, and now you have to integrate differential of T over T from T1 to T2, which is the initial temperature and the final temperature of the object. Of course, this is the natural log. Uh, that integral is the natural log. So then what it means is that your final expression is uh, pretty simple as well, T2 over T1. Right, so that is how you calculate the change in entropy when heating and cooling an object if the heat capacity is constant and doesn't change in the temperature range uh, that you're uh, experiencing uh, in that problem. Now, of course, the, uh, we have to talk a little bit about uh, what that heat capacity is, and you're gonna have various forms, right? In, uh, uh, when it's written like that, there will be an extensive heat capacity that depends on the system's size, but of course, we rarely work with those. We always work with intensive or per mole heat capacities, which are these ones. But of course, the, re the relationship between uh, those heat capacities is just that, right? Remember that the more heat capacity is simply the extensive heat capacity divided over the number of moles. So that heat capacity that we have right here is simply the number of moles multiplied by the bar heat capacity. Now the second change is that uh, your heat capacity varies 
if you're working at constant pressure or constant volume, right? So, so that has to be specified, and then you need to take either the constant pressure heat capacity or the constant volume heat capacity according to the specifics of the problem. Okay, so uh, generally we're going to be working at constant pressure, but that is not necessarily true. So I'm writing it here, but making the precision that this only applies at constant pressure. Okay, great. All right, so uh, let's just work out a numerical problem just to show you how sh uh, simple this is. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to calculate uh, what is the change in molar entropy, all right? So now we're going to be calculating what happens uh, or that we're asking this question, so on a per mole basis, when we breathe in oxygen at room temperature, so 298 Kelvin, into our lungs, and that gas, that oxygen, is actually being heated by um, our, our body, right? And that elevates the temperature of that uh, oxygen from 298 Kelvin, room temperature, to physiological temperature, which is 310 Kelvin. And the data that we have is that the constant pressure heat capacity of oxygen is uh, 29.36 joules per mole Kelvin. Right, importantly, uh, constant pressure, okay, so this is the one that we have to use, and then um, uh, notice that this number, it does not depend on temperature, right? So that's kind of the same number at 298 Kelvin and 310 Kelvin. So then we can use the integrated uh, version of this expression in which the heat capacity does not depend on temperature, so it can be factored out. All right, so well, if, you ha if we have this, then uh, the calculation is straightforward. Now this is an upper mole basis, so we have to divide this by the number of moles. Uh, so that is simply turns into the following, T2 over T1. Okay, so it's just punching the numbers and then get the result. All right, so 29.36 joules per mole Kelvin. Natural log of the final temperature, which will be physiological temperature, 310 Kelvin, over the initial temperature, which we're assuming to be room temperature, three, uh, 298 Kelvin. And then um, this cancels out. And then we have that, um, uh, you just get those numbers in the calculator. And this happens to be 1.16 joules per mole per Kelvin. Okay, so notice that this is a molar uh, change in entropy. We're calculating this on a per mole basis. Now, with this number, we could actually just uh, uh, go and calculate, well, what happens when you have 3 grams of oxygen or, or 7.2 moles of oxygen? You just multiply that number by the number of moles, and then you get the change in entropy for the specific amount that you might be interested in. Okay, so uh, this is kind of the easiest part of this change in, uh, calculating the change in entropy uh, of a substance wh whose temperature is changing, uh, and that's the one where the heat capacity is constant with temperature. So the question is, well, what happens when the heat capacity is not constant? Right, so we're going to come to this point uh, right here, and we're going to retake this uh, derivation by assuming that, well, now the heat capacity actually uh, is not is is not constant with temperature. It changes, and then the, the way that you will know it is because you will have expressions that will be something like this, uh, expressions where you might have a dependence of the heat capacity on temperature. So this is a polynomial. These will be constants, and those constants are different for every molecule. So whenever you see something like this, this actually tells you that uh, that heat capacity depends on temperature. And if it does, then we simply just have to bring it here, and you will actually have to carry out uh, the integral uh, integrated, right? So, so we're not going to be handling uh, very difficult integrals. This uh, probably is as difficult as things are going to get, so it will be just uh, the integral of a polynomial. Okay, so that would be one way to do it. Uh, just solve for this um, analytically, right? Carry out the integral, and then just punch in the, the values of the constants, and the temperatures in the final integrated expression. In the homework, you will have examples of how to do this. Now, there's another way to uh, carry out this integral, and that is uh, graphically, right? So as opposed to just trying to integrate analytically using uh, your integration techniques that you have learned in your mathematics course, courses, you can then actually do this uh, graphically. And the way to do this graphically is simply as follows. We can uh, rearrange that expression as this, 
from T1 to T2. And then uh, we just have to recall the geometric definition of an integral. And the geometric definition of an integral is simply the area under the curve where the curve here that you're representing is the integrand, so that you need to plot the heat capacity over T as a function of the integration variable, which comes here, that will be as a function of temperature. That is what is changing. Right? So suppose that this uh, uh, graph looks something like this. I don't know, maybe something different or something like that. Right? Uh, well, if, you, if this is your T1 and this is your T2, then that integral is simply the area under this curve. Okay, that area is just delta S, which is the same thing as uh, C over T differential of T from T1 to T2. Okay, so that would be the graphical way to do this, but of course you can also do it uh, analytically if you have the expression, uh, the formula for how the heat capacity depends on temperature. All right, so let's summarize this video. We have learned how to calculate uh, the change in entropy in a substance that is uh, uh, varying, whose temperature is varying. Uh, in the easiest uh, case, we're going to have that heat capacities will be constant with temperature, and then we have seen an applied problem for how to do that. In the more difficult or more mathematically involved uh, examples, you will have that the heat capacities will depend on temperature, and that means that you will have to carry out analytical integration or maybe you can do a graphical integration method like what we have right here. In the next video, we're going to continue to move on with uh, calculations of changes in entropy by uh, focusing on how to calculate the change in entropy in a phase transition.